when I got ready to give this seminar, I thought to myself, it's hard to talk to an audience you can't see. But I thought, perhaps putting myself in your shoes, I go back about 10 to 12 years and I say, how can I possibly teach doctors that they should be using um, a cone beam when I didn't even own one myself? And if I did own one, I'm only going to use it for implants. How do I make that pay for itself? So I had a lot of questions, and basically the questions were questions of ignorance. Until I had the experience with a cone beam, I really couldn't adequately answer for myself, let alone for anybody else, why I would go to the trouble to own one and what benefits I would derive from it. Fast forward a few years, and my son started a dental practice um, six years ago, and he came to me and he said, Dad, I'm really, I'm deep in debt school, I had to buy a practice, had to buy the building with the practice, and I need to find a way out of debt. <clears throat> and I said, Blake, what we're going to do is we're going to have you invest in a few things. And he said, okay, to like buying an implant kit and, and some other things. And when I said, and you need to buy a cone beam, he almost laughed at me. <laughs> and he said, I can't afford to buy a cone beam. And I turned to him and I said, Blake, you can't afford not to buy a cone beam. So hopefully by the end of the night tonight, you'll understand why I told him and gave him that advice. So having said that, what I would like to do is I would like to start with just any general dental situation, such as a patient walks in, they have a broken crown, you try to explain to the patient why that tooth would be would benefit from a better restoration such as a crown and you try to explain to them that they don't have that they've got a fracture line in the tooth the filling is fractured there's been a a base placed and there's just weakness all around but if you explain that to them they really don't get the picture if you take a photograph and then you show them the photograph they begin to understand because they can see what you're talking about. And most of the patients who see a picture of this tooth are going to allow you to talk to them about perhaps a crown, and they'll be more receptive to that idea for treatment. Typically, we have some objections to this treatment. Patient's going to ask you, what does it cost? And will my insurance pay for it? Is it going to hurt? How long is it going to last? And is it really worth it? Now, understanding these questions, if you're prepared for the question, then what you can do is you can take cost as an issue and perhaps move it to the side and say, we'll get to that issue. Is it going to hurt? Hopefully no, but realistically, some of our needles hurt a little bit and a little honesty helps there. When it comes to longevity, I know that every patient wants anything you do to last forever. Well, it's not realistic. It's not gonna last forever. But when I explain to them that a crown will last longer than a pin retained restoration, it will do more benefit for them and the benefit of chewing and, and holding up under stresses and pressures, then longevity becomes the value of not having to come back to the dentist and having it redone in the near future. So we try to address objections. When the patient understands the value of the treatment, we come back to the cost issue because now they're looking at what are the benefits to them, and then we have to figure out how to get the cost in line with their values. Um, they, can, they can now make a, a, an objective decision. If we give them cost up front, they tend to be a little bit hesitant to even listen to anything else we say. So we do a consultation, we have a discussion, we create value, we address the objections and point out the advantages and benefits of the recommended therapies. Now, why do I go through this? Because when I talk to dentists today, we have objections from the dentist to owning and using a cone beam device in their practices. The very first question we get from dentists is cost. The very next question is, well, what about the radiation exposure, the liability, the effects on tissue? Then we get this, well, what can I do with it other than implants? And finally, we don't even appreciate the value that a cone beam has in patient education. So what I'd like to do is address these issues one at a time, 
but I'm going to take cost and I'm going to move cost aside. We're going to talk about the issues that we see here and bring cost in at the end. So let's talk, start with radiation levels. There's a lot of concern on the part of dentists today about radiation levels. So I want them to understand that if you can look at things in numbers, you can begin to compare numbers. Just today, I was exposed to six to eight microsieverts for being awake in my office, working, driving home for lunch and back. I didn't go out on the golf course. I didn't go to the beach. I didn't expose myself to excessive sunlight, but six to eight microsieverts is what I was exposed to. If I still take film-based radiographs, the PA is 30 to 40 microsieverts. Now that's quite a bit more than just being awake. But if I now have switched from film-based to digital, that PA is eight microsieverts. So I begin to understand that taking a PA is really not much more than just daily activity. Most dentists were taught in school to take a full mouth series in order to gain information for diagnosis for a patient. And a full mouth series is 18 PAs. If 18 PAs are taken, I have over 150 microsieverts that I'm exposing my patient to. However, I'm gonna put a little caveat on that because that's only if you get the films the first time. And I'm sure none of my audience out there retakes a film ever. So 150 microsieverts for digital PAs in today's technology. Now I do a lot of flying. Um, I travel around doing a lot of lectures. So cross country flying is 40 microsieverts, five times the normal daily dose just to go up in an airplane and fly around the country. Finally, a number I want you to understand is a medical CT scan. 1,200 to 3,000 microsieverts, depending on the size of the CT scan, which we don't even compare to in terms of our dental um, exposures. Keeping these numbers in mind, let's now go to one manufacturer's radiation exposure numbers. An adult standard scan of an 8 by 15 image is 78.3 microsieverts. So to take an adult cone beam, which this is the scan we take a majority of the time in our practice, is less than half of taking a full mouth series of radiographs. But the information gained is incredibly more. We can even manipulate that number because I can do a child rapid scan, an eight by 10 volume, and get 25.2 microsieverts. Now, to put that in perspective, that's three PAs. How many times do we take two bite wings and two uh, PAs of the anterior teeth on a child? If you take four, that's more radiation exposure than taking a cone beam on a child. We can even reduce that further <clears throat> and do a <clears throat> small volume, and we can get that child scan down to eight to 10 microsieverts. Extra oral bite wings we can do now with this cone beam at 8.5 microsieverts. And think about extra oral bite wings, not having to put a sensor inside the mouth. We can achieve a Panorex image at about 10 microsieverts. Now, I have at the bottom of the slide only if your unit is brand new because technology continues to change. This is the unit I have in my office. Therefore, I'm familiar with the numbers. I know it's better and it's safer. The radiation is less, the image quality is better than the machine I had before. So these numbers are for the up, most up-to-date technology, and you need to go back and look at the numbers if you have a machine or if you're looking at a machine and how they compare. To do a cone beam, we need to understand what kind of views we're getting. So we're gonna talk about the three planes that we view a case in. The axial view is simply going from top to bottom. So we take the plane as seen on the left, we slide it up and down the arches. And as we go up and down the arches, you'll be able to see the pulp chambers, the crowns of the teeth. If we go to the coronal view, we're now taking that plane, sliding it front to back. Now we can see a tooth in the posterior section so that we see 
the mesial, I'm sorry, the buccal and lingual segments. The sagittal view, on the other hand, is now sliding side to side. So in an anterior tooth, we see the buccal to lingual section of the tooth. Along with the planes, we have field of view. And now I've given you three fields of view here. There in my current machine, we have five fields of view to choose from. So you can vary these as technology gets better, we're getting more fields of view. But a smaller field of view as seen on the lower left is going to be less radiation, but higher detail. Whereas the larger field of view as seen on the right is going to take more radiation to achieve the view and it inherently is not going to be quite as crisp and clear as the one on the left. Most general dentists really need the middle one, the medium field of view, where they're seeing both upper and lower arches, back to and including the wisdom teeth, and in some cases the airway, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. So now that we've identified the fields and the planes, let's take a look and see why we would use this in general dentistry and in what kind of mode. So let's take pedo, since that's probably the one thing I had the most objection to. Why would you ever take it on a child? <clears throat> so here I've got a 25 microsievert exposure to a child. And I can see both arches. I can see uninterrupted teeth. Teeth in their position in the arch in terms of rotations and developmental stages. I can see abscessed teeth, broken teeth. Everything that that child has in both arches is visible to me so that I can accurately diagnose and treatment plan. I'm not limited. The views are not distorted. Everything is very clear. Notice even in the lower right, that little thing that's called the epiglottis. I'm very, I'm having a lot of fun because I'm learning things and seeing things that I've not seen before. And just noticing an epiglottis is a new experience for me. The next case to do, look at on a child, uh, this patient was referred because there were some supernumerary teeth and they were lingually positioned. And the mother was considering having those teeth removed and the, the two dimensional films that had been taken previously were just simply not definitive enough to know how to approach them. What I found interesting is that the Picture on the left shows one of the supernumerary teeth vertically pointing apically. The picture on the right shows the other supernumerary tooth pointed coronally. So as we go in and try to uh, determine how to achieve uh, extraction of these teeth, it's just interesting to note that every little detail of their position is available. Then if we want to see caries on a cone beam, whether it's an adult or a child, this is a, a mixed or a uh, teenage child, how clear is it if you take and move the beam to the middle of the tooth where the caries exist in the interproximal, and not only can you see clearly the carious entry point in the enamel, but the fashion in which it's mushrooming into the dent. Now this is one of the times <clears throat> where I'm going to be clear and say it's not always the best device for, for noting caries because of the presence of other fillings or restorations that can distort the image on a cone beam. So we get something called cone beam hardening around metallic or dense objects. Here's a case where we have a potential pulpal exposure. Now, oftentimes I warn a patient and say, this tooth might require endodontics or we might have to consider extracting if you don't want it, a root canal. But to be very clear and know exactly what patients to warn and which ones to have that discussion with, it's very clear. They can see what a nerve is, if you point it out to them, and then what a cavity is and how close the two are. And now they understand why the root canal might be indicated. Not only do we see caries on this tooth, but we have a furcation involvement beginning between the palatal and the mesiobuccal roots, just a little bit of bone loss. So we can educate the patient as to the need for perio, good home care. We can see whether the tooth is uh, viable in terms of restoration. So looking at these teeth and getting maximum information is really the key.
If you do orthodontics, and for those of you who do, this is a 3D rendering of an impacted lower second bicuspid that also is 180 degrees rotated. And if you're trying to move the tooth into position, if you're trying to derotate it, whatever your mechanical plans are, this is really helpful to know the position of the tooth before you start and what's the expected result when you finish. What are you capable of? Now here's a two-dimensional panorex of an ongoing orthodontic case. This was in my office many years ago. The patient arrived for a routine hygiene visit. The panorex was taken and sent, or was sent to me, and I looked at it and I thought to myself, well, I see an impacted upper cuspid, and I don't see it being addressed. I also see something really different looking on the lower cuspid lateral on the lower right side. When I looked clinically at that situation, the orthodontist evidently is trying to reposition the cuspid in the lateral, and it looks like they're straining the supporting structures for the cuspid, trying to get it into position as the, the mechanics are applied. Now, I just, I didn't have any argument with the treatment, but I had just gotten my cone beam, and I decided that I would take a cone beam on this child just to see how much of a problem this was being. On the left is a three-dimensional view showing that the cuspid is almost completely out of the bone. And the view on the right is the cone beam image where the plane cuts through the center of the cuspid showing that it is barely attached by the lingual surface only and held in by the wires. And what I did is I took, a, made a copy of this cone beam and sent it back to the orthodontist with a recommendation that he carefully observe this and try to affect uh, a treatment that would restore or at least discuss with the patient the potential complications of this. I'm sure he didn't like to see it, but it was very clear to me that this was a problem he hadn't anticipated and that the tissue didn't allow us to see adequately, nor did the, the two-dimensional image in the panorex. Same case also shows that lateral that's being pulled on the lingual is almost completely extruded through the lingual buckle, the lingual plate of the mandible. Um, this is an orthodontist who sent a patient to me asking to expose the upper cuspids. So we did a rendering. We observed the position. I've got a CO2 laser, and so I created a window, bonded an appliance, and the orthodontist was able to move that down into position. So again, on the other side, locate the tooth, know exactly where to make the window, bond the appliance, and allow the, the orthodontist to do the work from there. These procedures are very easy and simple to accomplish. Uh, it took about 10 to 15 minutes to accomplish that. Periodontal disease is really, uh, it's prevalent. We, we deal with it in a, a lot of patients, a pretty good significant portion of our population. If you could see the bone loss on the left side in terms of furcation involvement, you could see on the right side that it goes clear from the buckle of the mesobuccal, distobuccal roots to the palatal root. You can see a through and through class three furcation. You can see a class two. You can see a furcation involvement between the distal buccal and the palatal root. That's very hard to see clinically. All periodontal, uh, periodontal evaluations should include a cone beam because you can see the morphology of the bone where it exists, angular bone loss versus horizontal bone loss. And there's a lot of advantages here that I had never anticipated until I started looking carefully at these scans. If I want to do implant treatment or surgery, well, I can plan a case, measure the bone, the width, the height. I can actually place the inferior canal, uh, mark it very brightly so that I can see a cross-sectional view and have it show up. I can see pathology. So implant treatment planning is really enhanced. Um, in this case, we've got, I've got a, I think I've got a slide out of position. Post-extraction placement of platelet-rich fiber. If we go back one slide, the case of the tooth that was 
to be extracted once we took it out, we place platelet-rich fibrin to preserve the site. Five months later, the patient is back reassessing for implant placement. <clears throat> we go in and we remeasure. Now I've got 14 millimeters of bone height. I have 11.4 millimeters of bone width. And what I find remarkable is I've started using platelet-rich fibrin instead of graft material into sockets that have intact buccal plates. And I'm getting very good results uh, without added cost. I'm getting very good quality of bone and I don't see shrinkage uh, of any significant degree at all. Now that I've got the patient back in the chair, we took a second cone beam, we placed the implant virtually, allowing for spacing between the apex of the implant and the infrarabular canal. The picture on the right shows that we allow for the submandibular fossa as far as planning our implant height, and then planning for the implant placement to be completely at the crest or slightly submerged. The finished result is accomplished with all the information supplied by the cone beam. I'm often asked, do you use a surgical guide on all of your cases? And the answer is no. I've been doing implants for about 20 years. I have very, a very high comfort level that if I can see the information on the cone beam, I can measure the distance between the teeth, I can envision the distance buccolingually. I typically feel very comfortable placing an implant such as this slightly below the crest, in the center position and approximately uh, mesiodistally centered. This to me is very simple to do and most people if they can virtually accomplish something then they can do the, the very thing they just virtually did in the mouth. So there are always two questions. For every dental thing, every dental patient you have, you want to know what the correct diagnosis is and then you want to know what the most likely treatment plans are that will satisfy the desires of the patient. What's the motivating factor for the patient, price or longevity? What you want to know is what seems to satisfy all of the, the parameters of what you feel is appropriate treatment and the patient feels is affordable treatment and desirable treatment for him. But if you don't have the correct diagnosis, you're beginning from a point of perhaps uh, you're beginning from a mistaken position. So let me let me show you what I mean. This is a slide of di a two-dimensional image, PA taken. Patient walks in and says, doctor, I have a pain in the lower right and it's on tooth number 30. Has a minimal restoration, doesn't appear to have any structural problem. There seems to be a cloudy area on the mesiobuccal root possibly a cloudy area on the distal root, mid root. Now, here's the problem. Most dentists will pick up on this little cloudy issue, but to explain that to a patient is next to impossible. They don't understand. It's not distinct enough. They really can't see, and if they can't see it, they have a hard time engaging in the process. The same image on a cone beam is simply a slice through the middle of that lesion, which shows it to be much bigger than we envisioned in the PA, and extending distal to that second root. Now, if this is clear to the patient, what is dark? What does the darkness mean? What is a lack of density in the bone? What does infection do to the bone? They can begin to understand that their choices are going to be either to do a root canal or to extract the tooth, and they'll understand why. Here's another picture. The patient comes in and says, doctor, I've got a pain in the lower right quadrant. Now, again, you've got two options, two, two legitimate choices here. One is a failing endo on the bicuspid, and the other one is the wisdom tooth involvement with the second molar. What you don't know is, is that wisdom tooth buccal or lingual. What you cannot see clearly is the apex of the tooth where the endodontics was performed. So you're trying as a clinician to come up with the correct diagnosis and your treatment plan depends upon knowing position, structures, 
details. If this patient were 69 years old and that wisdom tooth had been there for 60 years or 50 years, then why did it suddenly start hurting? So we take a, a P, we take a comb beam and we start looking in the coronal view, the sagittal view, and the axial view, and what we see is number 32 is slightly buckly positioned, which is now causing resorption of the distal buccal aspect of the distal root of the second molar. Why it waited this long to start hurting, I honestly don't know and I can't explain to the patient. But I do understand why it's hurting. I also understand that I cannot do a root canal and save that too. Any therapy here is going to involve a discussion about removing 31 and potentially removing 32 or at least a portion of tooth number 32. And I want to know for my own benefit, what's the correct treatment, what's the most beneficial, and what is it I feel I can accomplish, or should I refer this case out? The patient wants to know that they're going to have something done to resolve their issue, their problem. So what do I do? I went ahead and put the infrabular canal, drew it in. Now I can begin to evaluate this tooth and walk my way back along the tooth. Um, in this particular case, what I decided is removing the, the entire tooth was probably not going to happen. It would, re it would demand removing an awful lot of the bone superior and buckle to the tooth just to get to it, and it was endangering the intraalveolar canal. Another case involved an 18-year-old consult for wisdom tooth removal, and 17 has a significant relationship to the intraalveolar nerve. Is the nerve facial or lingual? What's the relationship to the second molar, the first molar? All of these things allow me to assess if I were to remove the tooth, to me the picture of the most interest is on the lower right, and if I were to remove that tooth, I would want to section part of the buckle away and lift the tooth gently toward the buckle to remove it, trying not to place any pressure on the infrabular canal. The distal root, see, we can go individually, root by root, and so what we have here is a picture that the distal root that is very intimately involved, and we feel like this is a case that we might want to refer out to the oral surgeon, but to do that, we would like to make a recommendation, maybe refer the, or send a copy of the comb beam with the case. If we decide to do it, we want to have a very, um, serious conversation with the patient about the potential of paresthesia. We just, there's a few more views of the same case, medial root of 32. Uh, again, very close to the infrabular canal. The distal root, again, appears to be very close, lingually touching the lingual aspect of the distal root. So, I decided that <clears throat> two-dimensional dentistry had some problems. These problems include image distortion. Depending on the angle of the x-ray cone tube head to the film itself, you can get either foreshortening or elongation. You can also get superimposition of structures, and if you take a film in three different planes, you can make three different images appear. We can get differential magnification of these images based on the simple geometry of the film to the cone to the tube. Also, it's difficult to see certain um, anatomic structures like the nasopalatine canal. Sometimes it's hard to understand what the maxillary sinus, the actual floor is, and why we see so many different lines and loops in there. Uh, the size of the canal or the size of the sinus, the shape and presence of septa within the sinus. Many of these things that I find interesting and, and important in surgery is difficult to see two-dimensionally. So what I want you to do for a second is I want you to take a look at this, and I want you to say to yourself, most dentists diagnose from a 2D radiograph, so just look 
at the picture on the left. Given that picture, you don't know what to diagnose. You cannot see anything in that picture that says there's a problem. But if you take the picture on the right, you now clearly see a fracture because you're looking at this <clears throat> in a plane that shows a cross-sectional view and the pathology is clearly evident. So if you have a patient on the left that you're trying to diagnose, treatment plan, and explain to them the treatment, and you have a patient on the right, which patient understands and sees the, the treatment clearly? Here's a case of a sagittal view of a second molar and a third molar that's not involved, but practical sense tells me that if I'm gonna take that second molar out, I'm going to have a discussion with the patient about taking out the third. If you look at the left picture on the left, the third molar looks well, a little bit, um, not too difficult, but if you look at the picture on the right, now you're seeing the cross-sectional view of that third molar you see how it is really bulbous and it will be very difficult to get out without sectioning. And just knowing that ahead of time can save you a lot of grief. Now we have an axial view showing a large fracture present mesiodistally. A coronal view showing the same tooth, only this time you can see the fracture and the extent apically, how far down it goes and if we wanted to do an endo buildup and crown on this tooth, the restoration would be two to three millimeters below the lingual crest of bone. So this tooth becomes a very difficult one to restore and a candidate for extraction. And this is something the patient can see this with you and they understand. One of the first patients I saw when I moved to my new office six years ago in South Carolina, came into my office, as many patients do, price shopping. Now, what he did is he had a bridge failed, and he came in, after going to his dentist, he came into my new office and he said, I just thought you might need some business, and I'd like to know if you will do the bridge for less than my other doctor. And he presented the fees of the other doctor, and he was basically just price shopping. And I, I asked him, I said, is cost really the biggest concern to you? And he said, yes, it is. So I also asked him if I could take a cone beam at no charge to him, since he's already had diagnostic workup done and x-rays done. I said, I'd be happy to do this at no charge, just to give me some information. And what I saw on that cuspid was an endodontic procedure that had been done perforating through the lingual of the tooth, and it was very much in danger. When I showed this picture to the patient, I said, if you spend the money you're thinking of spending on that bridge, you're very likely going to waste. So we took the tooth, wiggled it, and took it out, and it was fractured. This is a complete, um, a correct diagnosis where an incorrect diagnosis, incomplete diagnosis had been given. That patient had to reassess what was going to be important to him and how long his treatment was going to last. We had to go back and review all the questions. As we did that, he elected to do implant therapy to place a short bridge and a single tooth on the cuspid and some single crowns he spent quite a bit more money, probably three times the amount of money he originally planned on spending, but that's because he was now informed. So my question is, are cone beams necessary? You take a patient that walks into your office and says, doc, um, would, can you glue my crown back on? And you take a PA and you see this. Some of you are going to see a little bit of a cloudy area on the mesial root. Some of you are going to see a potential fracture line on the distal root. Some of you might see a little periodontal involvement on the distal root. The reason the crown came off in the first place is we have a very tapered, short preparation. So the patient has to decide whether they're going to spend $50 getting the crown glued back on, or $1,000 getting a new crown made, or three or $4,000 getting the tooth out and an implant done. 
Now, if I approach them that way, they're probably rarely going to choose the implant. But if I approach them by showing them a very clear view that there, no, there's no fracture on the distal, yes, there is some bone loss and support loss, and the lesion is fairly significant on the mesial, they now can make an informed decision based on how long is this going to last me, what's the longevity of each of these treatments. Now, one of the questions I want you to ask yourself is, why is it you cannot see the lesion as well in the picture on the left? It's for this reason. Now we see a cross-sectional view of dense bone on the lingual cortical plate, dense marrow space, the volume of the tooth structure, and then there is a lesion, but it's basically hidden in the mass of information. If I draw a line, the green line is the plane of the cone beam that we viewed the previous picture in, showing clearly the outline of the inferior canal, the lesion, and the tooth. We eliminate all of the mass of tooth and bone volume that tends to obscure the lesion so the patient can see it very clearly. So if we know the location and size of a canal, well, we can pre-plan our endo treatments. I use an, an apex locator, but now what I do is I take a cone beam image, I pre-plan the measurement, then I go in with the apex locator in my instrument, and my instrument has got to be within a half a millimeter one way or the other of my measurement. If it is when my apex locator indicates I'm at the right point, I now have two-step verification of my endodontic therapies. Seeing the accessory canal, you'll notice on the lower right, in the picture on the lower right, that the apex has a small accessory canal about two millimeters above the apex. I can see that in the picture on the left. So seeing the accessory canal or the bifurcation gives you a better barometer of success in your work and it, and it forewarns you when a canal bifurcates or when two canals join together, this is what you want to see on a cone beam. Now this is one of the first cases I ever had and it was a very difficult case. I had my cone beam about a week. This patient comes into my office and she's had, she had five sets of dentures in a plastic bag. She had this done by a, a prosthodontist in Denver. And she came in saying, I've had these dentures, I've had them made, remade, and I've got all these dentures, but my mouth still hurts. When I asked her to localize her pain, she said it's inside, down below her tongue. So I had this brand new machine. I thought, well, I'm not putting an implant in, but let's just take a look at this case. And the axial view showed four implants within the bone when the plane was up in the coronal aspect of the bone. But as I slowly walked down apically through the bone, the implants began to exit the bone. Further down apically, three of the implants are almost completely out of the bone, and the fourth is really, really close. By the time I get down to the last picture, you would swear that implant's completely out of the bone. So we were getting impingement of the lingual tissues, had nothing to do with the appliances that he made, it had everything to do with the implant placement. And he had placed these without a cone beam. Now this is a 34-year-old female that lives quite a distance from me. And she called me up and she said, I've got this question. She happens to be a family friend. I've got a problem tooth and I've got a dentist telling me that I need to have some work done. I asked her what the treatment plan was and the treatment plan, the diagnosis was a fractured tooth and the treatment plan was to do an endodontic procedure along with an apicoectomy, remove the root of the tooth, which is approximately five or six millimeters of the tooth, and try to preserve this for as long as possible. They were afraid of, of she's a thin biotype, they were afraid of, of not having a good aesthetic result with either a crown, a bridge, or an implant. So we talked and talked, and she finally bought a plane ticket and came out, 
and we tried to confirm the diagnosis. Well, she didn't have a fracture, even though it looks tenuous. The picture on the left confirms there's no fracture. There is, however, internal root resorption. What we would what we did is we measured, and if we proceeded with the treatment plan that had been proposed, we would have wound up with a crown of over 10 millimeters supported by a root of almost three and a half, or about a three to one crown to root ratio. Not a good scenario, and during the, the time that she had that, the bone would have resorbed. So we planned an implant, and ideally we would have had an implant with more buccal bone, and I drew a yellow line in so you can see where I would like the bone to be. We discussed procedures with the patient, we gave her all of the problems with long distance treatment, and she wound up having the tooth extracted. We debrided the lesion, and you can see it's clear over to the root of the central incisor. We were able to place an implant, a 3.5 millimeter implant, and graft at the same time. We used some IPRF, created a nice thick graft, closed, temporized, and sent her on her way. Now, when she came back four months later, the graft had worked. We had a nice volume of tissue, and we're now ready to restore the case. We feel like this was a better scenario for her in the long run. It satisfies that value statement of, I want this to last as long as possible. And it satisfies the aesthetic problems that the, pay, that the doctors were seeing that they didn't feel like they could address. Here's another case where we have two-dimensional images. These images show a problem that's kind of cloudy, hazy, and difficult to see. So as we go through, we look at this lesion, and we measure the lesions. 15 millimeters vertical height, 20 millimeters in width. It's over 12 millimeters buccal to lingual. It envelops the inferior canal, both superior and inferior to it. So we do an axial and coronal view. We know that we've got to remove the lesion and yet leave the canal in place. So we're not gonna go in and curette the entire lesion out. The teeth were removed. The lesion was curetted partially. We then, and we sent that lesion in for biopsy. We then placed platelet-rich fibrin into the socket because we were afraid of impinging on the, the uh, inferior canal with anything of a solid nature. The entire defect was filled with PRF only. We finished, the patient came back. At four months, the ridge looked good. Now at four months, I didn't expect the lesion to fill in, but we took a second follow-up comb beam just to evaluate. And what we see is osteoid material being formed in the defect. We see the canal now clearly outlined and the cortical plate forming again, so that we have very good hopes that within the next six to eight to 10 to 12 weeks, we can place an implant in very solid bone. So what we have here is an airway. Now I'm not into sleep apnea to a large extent, but what I do have is an understanding that if I'm going to be taking cone beams, taking a picture of airways is both topical and of interest to patients, and either I can try to learn to treat or I can send off and have patients uh, evaluated by somebody who likes to treat this. This is a normal airway. As you look to the right, for above the epiglottis, you can see a spacing between, or in the trachea and in the airway, and you can measure this volume. The next picture is going to be of a restricted airway. Now this patient is a very heavy set man, and so it's not unusual to see a restricted airway like this. This is not diagnostic of a sleep apnea patient. This would go along with a good health history. Discussion, do you wake up at night? Have you ever, do you snore? Have you ever considered a sleep study? I actually had a lady come in and ask me for a sleep study. This was her. She said, I would like to get fitted for a sleep apnea appliance. I'm getting ready to go get a sleep study. Now, I looked at that and I said, there's a problem here. And I asked her history and she'd had throat cancer five years previously and had surgery done. I said, this is something 
where a sleep apnea appliance is not going to help you. You need to go back and be evaluated by your doctor to see if that simple tissue growth in there, if that's a result of scarring from the surgery or what the aspect of it is. The next thing that happens very important for you to understand. Doctors are always asking me, well, am I not responsible for anything I find, no matter whether I was trained for it or not? The answer is this. You're trained in dentistry. You're not trained in throat cancer. So when I was confronted with this case, I recommended to the patient she go back and see her primary, her, her physician for oncology. Well, that physician sent me an email and said, we don't see any problem with sleep apnea for this patient or being fitted for a sleep apnea appliance, but do you feel that the lesion is reoccurring? Now, that's a very difficult question for me to answer, so what I did is I wrote back and said, that is not my position to diagnose that kind of a lesion. That's why you need to diagnose. However, a sleep apnea appliance is going to take time and cost money and this patient will not benefit from it. I'm trying to save her from the, from the um, agony of going through something that has no chance of success. So we're always looking to see what is it that we have, dentally speaking, but if we see something that we are not familiar with, we're perfectly within our rights to refer that. We are not legally responsible to treat anything that we were not trained for. So CBCT technology can reduce complications and prevent mistakes, especially in the first step of diagnosis. It can be used in restorative dentistry, orthodontics, extraction, surgery, endodontics, implant dentistry, identifying pathology, assessing anatomic anomalies. In other words, it can be used in every aspect of dentistry that we, we engage in. So, my goal here is to improve vision. Vision is the key to diagnostics. What is your vision of dentistry? That's the key question we need to ask ourselves. How much do we see? How much does our patient see? And can we see more if we were to engage in this kind of technology? Okay, so at this point, we'd like to answer some questions. All right, so Jason asks, what voxel size are you, are you using or normally scanning at? So Jason, here's what I've discovered about these machines. The smallest voxel size gives me the most accurate picture, but some machines claim they can reduce radiation by increasing voxel size or making it variable. I hope the discussion about radiation explains why I use the smallest voxel size every time to get the best image quality every time. And I don't vary the pixel amount because the amount of radiation is so minimal in today's machine that I don't consider that to be an issue. Whether I'm at 50 microsieverts or 60 microsieverts is clinically insignificant. So the voxel size is as small as possible. The next question is, how are you charging for a quad or a full arch CBCT? Charging for a cone beam. I used to think that I had to charge so much for cone beams that I made it pay for itself in the machine. For example, if I'm charging $100 for a Panorex, a cone beam had to be $250. Well, then I would only take it when I saw the need for it. What I discovered is the more cone beams I took, the more information I gathered to cr that created more dentistry that I had to then present to patients. I now feel that it's appropriate for me to charge $100, the same fee as I do for a Panorex, unless the patient A, can't afford it, or B, just had one taken and charged in another office, in which case I still take the cone beams and I take them for free. You're not going to pay for this machine by charging higher fees for your cone beams. You're going to limit the number of cone beams you take. You're gonna pay for this machine by creating the dentistry from the information that you see that you didn't anticipate seeing. The next question, I have a cone beam in my office, but compensation 
is difficult since dental insurances do not cover the cost. Any recommendations? Uh, insurance is a game, unfortunately, and what we do is we have a machine that takes a Panorex image, therefore we can legitimately charge a Panorex fee and then switch to the cone beam information to do the reading and the diagnostics. So we can play the game and charge for a Panorex since one is available, but we don't have to use that image to do our diagnosis. If we don't charge for the cone beam, that's fine because we're going to gain the information from the dentistry that we're going to do. I hope that helps. How do you know which machine to buy? Okay, and what price range are we talking about? Uh, I'm not a salesperson, <clears throat> therefore I don't know the price ranges. I think machines can be bought for as little as seventy or eighty thousand dollars, and as much as a hundred and fifty or sixty thousand. But I, that's a total guess on my part. The real question here is which machine gives me the most diagnostic information and is easy to access that information in their software programs and has the lowest amount of radiation but yet the highest fields of view. There's many technical aspects to a Combi machine. When I find a machine that satisfies me clinically, I will then ask the question of how much that one costs. The machine I own, uh, the brand name is Prexion, and they're a mid-range machine. They're, they're not the highest, they're not the lowest. I feel there's many advantages to that machine, and I think that's the one that caught my attention. That's the one that has kept my loyalty because I've had very little problems and they're very good people to work with. So I, I could make a recommendation there. I use an imaging center, what's your thoughts? Okay. All of you who own a cone beam know that it takes a little time to adjust reading three-dimensional images. And so maybe you're gonna spend 30, 40 minutes a day practicing and using these images, maybe two or three hours a day, but in a matter of weeks or months, you're going to be very comfortable. If you use an imaging center, you are not gonna be able to take a cone beam on a majority of your patients. You're only gonna take those that you think there is an issue. And you are not ever going to be real proficient at reading those images and manipulating the software. So I think it's a good short-term solution, but I, I don't think it's what I would recommend for my son or somebody I'm very close to. I think you need to be able to develop this in-office concept of diagnosis. How important is the size of the focal spot? The smaller the focal spot, the better the quality of the image. And everything is about quality. I see a lot of images and doctors and the courses I give on implants and their, their images are difficult at times to read. I hope you saw some good images tonight. The focal spot must be as small as possible, 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. What is my most frequently used field of view? My adult standard field of view, which is 8 by, eight by 15. And that's the most common one I use. I will go to a wider field of view, 10 by 15. If I've got a large male, I mean a big bone structure in his head, sometimes I have to get a little bit more. But I probably take one standard adult size and I take that about 95% of the time. Um, I have a difficult time reading some fractures or pathology in my images. Any recommendations as to where to learn more to read these images? Again, based on the quality of your machine, if you have a problem, there's mentors out there that can help. Uh, I help a lot of doctors I know in my, in my courses. And there's also a group called Beam Readers, which there's, uh, there, that organization will help read images. Or if you see something on an image you're not used to, you're not familiar with, they have uh, trained people that can identify and give you feedback and help you to see things clearly. I, I feel like there's help out there and hopefully you can go through your cone beam company and they can steer you to the right people to get help with their images. Um, does it help you in diagnosing the CBCT Hounsfield scale? Hounsfield units is a very particular means of measuring density. And so what, the, what my machine does, and I think probably most machines, is they measure relative density 
in terms of the voxel density. So you take the, the voxels in a given pattern and it will give you a number. That number might be a thousand around a filling and it might be 50 in the marrow space of the bone. So relatively speaking, not directly in Hounsfield units, but it does give relative densities. Do you feel a cone beam should be taken on every patient like we do with panorexes every five years? So we have a hard time getting away from tradition. And if we think that taking a cone beam is important and valuable and more diagnostic than a panorex, the answer is yes. And in fact, it becomes my screening tool every four to five years, that patient's getting a cone beam. And at 78 microsieverts, it's a completely safe thing to do with that patient. I get more information than I do a panorex, more diagnostic information for me and the patient. So the answer is yes. How long do the scans take? They can take anywhere from nine seconds, which is what my machine is, up to 30 seconds to do a scan, depending on the kind of scan that you're doing and the machine. The longer the scan takes, the more chance there is for a slight movement or a little distortion. So by taking a quick scan, less than 10 seconds, it's very easy for the patient to settle in, have the scan taken, and then to be out of the, out of the machine. Do different machines take longer? Yes, every machine is unique. You should always go and shop the machine by what it can do and the image quality, and then at the end, ask the price. Do not ask the price in the beginning. I'm a pediatric dentist wondering how this can enhance my practice. I hope you understand right now that this enhances every aspect of dentistry. And at the reduced radiation levels that we currently have in our new technology, pediatrics, orthodontics, oral surgery, perio, endo, implant dentistry, general dentistry, restorative dentistry, all benefit from having cone beam scans. Uh, now that I'm getting a CBCT, do I have to purchase expensive imaging software to plant implants? In some machines, the answer is yes. In my machine, I have a, a library with implants in it, and I virtually place every implant with what's built into the software. I can have surgical guides made from my images in that it's uh, open architecture, so I can use this with any system out there. CBCT and orthodontics, we've pretty much explained that. And can, now, can you take a cephalometric film with a cone beam on the newer machines? And on this machine, I know you can get a, a cone, a uh, cephalometric attachment, so yes. How important is field of view? Depend, if I'm an endodontist, I'm going to have a small field of view. I don't need to do diagnosing of the full arch. But for most general dentists, I want full arch. And if I'm an oral surgeon or an orthodontist, I might want to do full field of view, chin to skull. Can we have your contact information to be able to have some assistance during purchase? Of course, I've got my email address listed on my last slide at the bottom. I'm very comfortable helping dentists. I, I've been teaching for 20 years. I enjoy it. And uh, I enjoy the camaraderie that we develop as we do. So I'd be happy to help you. Um, I can't speak for all cone beam companies because I have not had experience with all of them. But I think what you want to check is the quality of the machine and the support that the company gives, the education they give to get you trained in. I think that's very important. And that's what I'm very happy with with my company. Uh, one more question here. Is it necessary to change your computer system with the Prexion? No. That's a really good question. When the Prexion was installed, they have a self-standing server. And what that means is any of the computers in my office can pull up the image off of that server. But there's no licensing, and it doesn't put any demands on the remote computers. So I, there's nothing in my computer that had to be changed to pull up this image. And all the images are stored on the server provided by the company when I bought machine so that's standard with all of their machines I, I know that's not true with all of the cone beams out there but it is with mine thank you